So let's begin with uh, proper floor tensions. This is a classic chant of the hula dancer. The setting is the pristine Hawaiian rainforest and the cloud kiss floats up the West Maui Mountain. The translation of the chant makes it clear that in the Hawaiian world view, the upland realm is the home of the gods, a sacred place from which Laka, the goddess of hula, confers inspiration and personal growth, um, not on just anyone, but those committed to her care. There's a Hawaiian saying that reflects this relationship well. Um, the land is the chief and the people merely servants. When we attend hula events, such as Mary Monarch in Hilo or Prince Lot Festival at Moanalu Garden, um, we sometimes find ourselves glimpsing, especially through the hula kahiko, the ancient dance, a hint of the intimate relationships between people and their natural settings that was a fundamental part of existence in Hawaii before Western contact. Islands of Hawaii, far more than white sand beaches and palm trees, boast a huge range of ecosystems and conditions. And I don't need to spend much time with this group going over such aspects as the topographic range from flat to vertical, um, the dynamics of land ranging in age from just formed and devoid of life to climate forest supporting thousands of species. Um, from the, the extremes of our moisture conditions, from extremely dry to arguably the wettest spot on Earth, or our elevational breath from zero to just shy of 14,000 feet. This was a setting that provided not only for bountiful necessities, but the rich luxuries of Hawaiian life a natural setting that enabled Hawaiian culture to flourish as one of the pinnacles in Polynesian society, excelling in voyaging, in feather work, fishing and fish ponds, household amenities, kapa fabrics, and crafts of all kinds, and generating an equally rich cultural system in the pre-contact society that developed within it. Hula was but one of the many cultural developments of ancient Hawaii. And it's one of the most strongly expressed today. Therefore, it continues to be an excellent venue for exploring the relationship of Hawaiians to the natural world. As we explore these natural connections, I want to examine three major themes. First, the spiritual foundations of hula and the major deities of the ancient dance form. We'll see how from ancient times, hula was an art um, dedicated to specific deities in the Hawaiian pantheon and that these were associated with specific plants and animals. Second, hula clothing, ornamentation, and instruments form the material expressions associated with hula that came from both cultivated and wild sources. And finally, the mele, the chants, and the songs of the hula from ancient times time to today celebrate and incorporate elements of the aina, land, sea, and sky. The goddess of volcanism, Pele, perhaps the most widely known of the Hawaiian deities, is strongly associated with hula via the epic tale of Hi'iaka Ikapolio Pele. In this oral tradition, Hi'iaka Ikapolio Pele, the youngest and most beloved sister of the fire goddess, is sent on a quest that takes her across the island chain for her sister. Early on, she encounters Hopoi, a forest goddess, dancing on the shore at the edge of her hala forest. Iyaka is entranced by the movements of Hopoi and her dance and asks her to teach them to, to Hi'iaka, thus providing the origin not only of hula, but of the tradition of teaching hula. So just as Ho'okupu or offerings are presented at the edge of the volcano, 
So also, many dancers of the Pele repertoire are moved to provide hula to honor Pele in her home of eternal fire. But as we heard in the chants that began this talk, the primary deity of hula is the goddess Laka, a forest deity. In, ancient, uh, in the ancient Hawaiian universe, the world was divided into a dichotomy, the realm of people, the Waukanaka, occupying the lowlands, where that which grows is the result of human effort. And above the comfortable lowland zone was the Wawahua, the realm of the gods, where human effort had nothing to do with the virgin growth of native forests, and where conditions were often wild and elemental. Indeed, the wilds of the Wawakua were considered profoundly sacred and perilous for human incursion. Only small parties led by specialists with knowledge of the forest and its resources could enter the Wawakua and only with purposeful, positive intent and after rigorous ceremonial protocol. Now, the Kumu Hula, the Hula master, was one of those um, specialists that could enter the realm of Laka. And one of the main reasons for such entry was to gather the whole kupu the offering to the kuahu of Laka, Laka's altar. One of the plants found only in the Wawakua is the Olapa, a tree in the same family as ginseng, bearing compound leaves, typically with five leaflets, born on graceful, long petioles. Like that, come on, where is it? There we go. This means that in the slightest breeze, the leaves of the olapa are in motion, even while nothing else in the forest is moving, drawing attention to the singular beauty of the tree. So it's no surprise that the Hawaiian word for a standing hula dancer is olapa, representing the grace of standing motion. One of the dominant trees of the Wawakua in ancient times was lama, a Hawaiian tree related to ebony and persimmon. Its fruits are like miniature persimmons, but neither the foliage nor the fruit provide the connection of this tree to hula. Instead, we must look lower to the kumu, the trunk of the tree, for the answer. <clears throat> the wood of the lama forms the central offering on the kuahu, the altar of laka, at the halau, the teaching grounds of the hula. The word lama means light and symbolizes enlightenment, a symbol accentuated with kapa dyed bright yellow. So the central offering of the kumuhula and the kuahuhula represents enlightenment, a vital element in any learning endeavor. And what we see below the lama and yellow kappa is also important. We see several of the kino lau of laka. A kino is a physical form, and lau is a word that refers to a large but generally manageable number. So the kino lau is a set of physical manifestations of a deity. For a fire goddess such as Pele, the kino lau can be fumes, dense smoke, a red glow, licking flame, molten rock, and the solidified forms of volcanic action. But for an upland forest goddess such as Laka, the Kinolau are native plants of the Wawakua. And on this Kuahu, for example, we see the red liko or leaf buds of the, of the Ohi Alehua, the fine greenery of Palaholai ferns, and the more leathery and thick fronds of the Pala below them all. The Ohi Alehua tree, besides being one of the kino of Laka, uh, oh, sorry, um, besides what being one of the kino of Laka, is the dominant species in the Hawaiian wet forest on all islands. It's an adaptable and extremely variable species in flower color, leaf shape, stature, etc. And its nectar rich flowers provide the mainstay for Hawaiian honey creepers, such as the apopane. Oh, we're going to have trouble, I think. <laughs> the red flowers of the ohia tree are called lehua, and among the meaning, uh, meanings of this word are the blossoms of the ohia tree, the first warrior to die in battle, and most relevant, perhaps, to the offering of lehua onto the kuahu hula. Lehua means expert, and particularly an expert in the physical skill, such as hula. On this kuahu, we see, in addition to the llama wood and yellow kapa, a lay of the native vine called maile. It grows as a slightly woody vine or sprawling bramble of long stems bearing leaves of various size and shape. Maile is another of the kinolau of Laka, often growing luxuriantly, and its sap exudes a wonderful and unmistakable fragrance, fresh, cool, and softly sweet. When braided into lay, 
they are among the most valuable of Hawaiian ornamentation and add both fragrance and grace to any dancer and comprise an apt offering to the Kuahu Hula. Palahalai is one of the most prized of the ferns for lay making, delicate to look at but remarkably resistant, holding its form and color through the most vigorous of dances. It's no surprise at all that this is not only a popular lay for hula, but another of the kinolau of laka. Here a male dancer displays a lei po'o, a head lei, and kupe'e lima, a wristlet of palapalai fern, augmented by a lei a'i, a neck lei of my lei. Ie Ie is a climbing liana that sprawls through the dense vegetation of the wawakua, and its large, bright orange flowers are placed on the kuahuhula as another of the major kinolau of laka. Ie Ie is also kinolau for the god Lono, who presides over the winter wet season, when games and performing arts such as chant and hula are prominent. It's neither confusing nor uncommon for multiple gods to claim the same kino love. For example, the hua blossoms might be kino of laka, but they're also a major symbol of the goddess Pele. And the warrior connection mentioned earlier places the lehua firmly among the kino love of Ku, god of war. Neither is, it, neither is it an either or situation as can be seen in the name of one of the Ku deities, Ku ka ohi a laka, where both one male and one female are named and combined and connected by their shared kino. Palapepe is the last of the plant kino lawa blocka that are most appropriate on the Kuapu Hula. Its foliage re resembles that of Ie Ie. So instead of sprawling, the Halapepe is an erect, many branched tree. The flowers of the Halapepe are quite distinct, brilliant clusters of yellow that can be worked into lei. Before we leave the Kinolau, we must be sure not to neglect Hawaiian animal forms. Many people might be familiar with a giant Hawaiian dragonfly called Pinao, a large relative of the green garner. Any of the dragonflies of North America, mm -hmm. is the largest dragonfly Not surprisingly, the Heiau, I'm sorry, it graces the skies of Hawaii and did not escape notice in ancient times. There's a Heiau, a temple on Hawaii that's named Pinao. And not surprisingly, the Heiau is situated next to a spring that still flows today. The freshwater spring is an important one to the Pinao because its larvae are aquatic. Hawaiians call these larvae lohe lohe. And because they grow into, grow into the largest dragonfly in the United States, the lohe lohe is also quite a hefty insect in its own right, stalking at the bottoms of large freshwater pools in every stream, feeding on anything smaller than them. It's quite a surprise to many people then that the lohe lohe are also an appropriate offering on the kuahu hula. But two elements bring logic to this religious act. First, lohe means to attend, listen, pay attention. And to redouble that important element of learning, lohe lohe, makes it doubly appropriate. It is the nature of the lohe lohe to sit silently and watchfully in their pool. If you've ever watched them hunt, they sit perfectly still until a movement or vibration catches their attention. Then they immediately reposition themselves toward the object of their attention and wait further. This kind of attentiveness is exactly what a humuhula requires of their students, silence and total bodied attentiveness. Furthermore, when the lohe lohe eats, it's an amazing explosive extension of special grasping mouth parts that quickly apprehend their prey. The word for such grabbing, apo, is related to the word a'apo, which means to quickly learn, to readily and rapidly understand the meaning of something. So, for the kumuhula, the lohe lohe symbolizes the perfect student, attentive and quick to grasp and understand what is being taught. Moving from the kinolau of hula, the second theme deals with hula clothing, ornamentation, and instruments, which form the material expressions associated with hula. These come from both wild and cultivated sources. The clothing of the male hula of ancient times is called kapa, which is a pounded cloth of the paper mulberry called wauke. Hawaiian kapa is recognized as some of the finest in all of Polynesia, and the art of kapa making is seeing a resurgence today. Once the kapa is produced, it's an off-white canvas ready for further elaboration. The dyes for kapa derive from many plants and animals, ranging from the black soot of burned kukui nuts, the red extracted from noni roots, 
the green of Hawaiian cotton, and the purple of sea urchins, applied in a variety of ways, but perhaps the best known of these are with the intricately carved bamboo stamps called Ohe Kapala. This engraving of Hawaiian men in the era of early Western contact shows the elaborate way kapa was sometimes tied for hula, although other engravings show bare minimum use of kapa. Aside from the kapa worn, the ornamentation of the lei and hula is a major part of the connection of hula to the natural world. The, this dancer wears a lei po'o, a, le, a head lei of fern, but around his neck and wrist are kupe'e shells. The kupe'e is a native nerite that was used for lei making. It was so popular for wrist and ankle ornaments that the word for such ornaments of the extremities is kupe'e, although the shells may be strung in groups as shown here. The essence of the kupe'e is a single beautiful shell on a cord around the wrist. In fact, some rare and colorful, colorful varieties of kupe'e were reserved for chiefly ornamentation only, such as the banded kupe'e anue nue, literally rainbow kupe'e. Besides the classic Kinalao plants, there's a huge range of native plants that can provide the ornamentation of hula. In lowland dry forests, Ilima can assume a tall shrub form as seen here at Pu'u Okali on Maui. The delicate flowers of Ilima are painstakingly strung into one of the most highly prized lei of Hawaii. And it's interesting to me that one of the most delicate of lei comes from the hot, dry lowland, in strong contrast to the wet and lush fern and lehua from the cloud forest. It suggests to me, along with the inclusion of Lama and Halapepe, that Laka is not only a goddess of wet forest, but also of the dry forest that is so rare in modern Hawaii. And thanks to the research that went into the book Nale Makamai, we know that much more than Le Ilima came out of the Nahele Malo'o, the dry forest zone. Here are some fine examples. Le Wiliwidi, Le Uhiuhi, Le Halapepe, and Le Alahe'e. Returning to this image, one of the earliest depicting hula, we can see two items that count as both ornamentation and instruments. What's going on? The uliu is the uli uli, a gourd rattle, um, often decorated with feathers and filled with hard seeds, and the kupe'e wabai, the leg ornament, made of hundreds of dog teeth tied onto a dense cord framework. What's not obvious until you wear the kupe'e wabai is that it's also an instrument the teeth hang in loose contact with each other so that when the foot is stamped, as in the kui movement, they make a remarkable sound. Here's a closer look at the item. The kupe e niho i lio can have from 300 to 600 or more teeth per side, tied together with olona, a native Hawaiian plant, providing one of the strongest natural fibers known. Olona is a nettle, but in Hawaii, none of our nettles sting since they evolved in a setting lacking any large herbivorous mammal. Hawaiians extracted and wove the fibers of olona into a wonderfully strong cordage. Nearly all of the finer items fastened with cordage were made from olona. So the hundreds of dog teeth were tied onto a framework of olona with loops on the edges for lacing onto ankle or calf. Meanwhile, the uli uli is at its basic level a hollow gourd into which hard seeds such as those of maamane were put to provide a rattling sound. The feather shield, like cap, hides a short handle grip made of bases of tea leaves. With the fe feather disc missing, the underlying construction can be readily seen. Olona cord secures the framework of tea leaf stems in a cone upon which the ornamentation could be attached. Just as the uli uli's rattle vessel is of cord, so the basic hula drum is made of two ipu gourds joined and lashed together. Here's a bit of a classic chant. Kualo loa kea au, with the sound of the ipu heke of the <coughs> of plants, and careful selection of just the right shaped gourd 
combined to give the classic form of the Ibu Heke. The Ibu Heke was and continues to be the primary percussion instrument for hula, as it was for the exhibition of hula at King David Kalakawa's Jubilee in 1886, and at a recent uniki ceremony on Kauai. Otherwise, the hula drum, the pahu, is generally reserved for the most sacred of dances, evolving from their use during the rites at Heia of the great temples. For example, here's an excerpt from a hula pahu, a sacred drum dance from the Heia of Paka'alana in the valley of Waipio, which was the royal center in the time of Liloa. generally carved from the base of the new, the coconut tree, while the head of the papu is of ili mano, the skin of the shark. The ancestors of Hawaiians brought ohe, bamboo, to Hawaii from Polynesia, perhaps a thousand years ago, and the thin walled form of Shizostachium glaucifolium is used to make a variety of hula instruments, including the pu'ili split rattle, ka eke eke two percussion instrument, and the ohe hanoihu, the nose flute. I remember making my first notes flute in the Valley of Wailau on Molokai long ago, and though I've made many since, that first one is still my favorite. And here it is, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Can you find this species of silver sword? 
Only in the Aina Ko'ola wa Pale Pala on Maui can you find the Akohe Kohe or Crested Honey Creeper. Only in the Aina of Koke'e on Kauai can you find the fragrant Mokihana. Only in the Aina Ko'ola wa Oahu grows the famous Lehua Ahihi. And Oahu also boasts nearly all of the species of the Pupu Kanioe, the singing land snail. In the mele called Manu O'o, the beauty of a lover is compared to the brilliant feathers of the O'o bird in the region called Malama on the island of Hawaii. symbol of exalted status, and the chill of the rain is her intense love. The Yehibia course is the honey creeper that provides the magnificent scarlet of the feathered cloaks of Hawaiian royalty, while the Manu O'o mentioned earlier provided the brilliant yellow. It's no coincidence that both birds were denizens of the same upland Wawapua in which the gods dwell, and in which the inspiration for Hula comes. Let's finish up with one of my favorite Hawaiian songs. The beautiful Hula Waika is the modern adaptation of a chant from the time of Kamehameha I. Waika is an upland forest region of the Kohala Mountains on the north end of the island of Hawaii, and very few people visit this forest, which does not lie near any of the main roads. But to a biologist such as myself, the amazing thing about this song is that the words of over 300 years ago mention plants within the native forest that, that still exist there today. A celebration of the connections that remain between land and people expressed in Hula. Oh, come on. 
Yeah. <laughs> okay, so that's the that's the end of the of the presentation. Um, so I hope you you got a feel for the kinds of connections that that Hula has with the natural world, both in the material culture, the the spiritual and religious <coughs> background of it. And then in just the sheer amount of material that goes into the words of, of Luda that are inspired from the natural world. Those are the three elements. Um, it's these kinds of details, I think, that uh, we can use to build appreciation of, of people in general to what we have here in Hawaii. So that's the, that was the point of this, of this presentation. If folks want to unmute on the on the phone, if they have any if they have any questions, um, please feel free to do so now. And we've often we've often had a good discussion, so I'm going to continue recording, even though even though um, right there. The leader has unmuted your mic. Any questions from the muted. From folks can you talk to a little bit about sort of the conservation ethics that I did. organizations have, particularly with Mary Monarch coming in? Yeah, I'll take them to somebody. That's how I take care of it. Um, the, and, and things like that. Yeah, um, conservation ethic is a, is a personal thing. I think it comes from, from individual training. Uh, and there are some who are allow that are really good at that. At that. They have really strict protocols on where and when they where they can collect, for example, lay material. Uh, others will not uh, will not collect unless they're also planting or in some way helping helping the area. I know some places, uh, some halal that, for example, have their favorite palapalai patch, and they'll go in and if there are weeds, they will remove those weeds and then encourage the encourage the native plants to grow. Um, the rapid ohi death crisis that faces us now is kind of an interesting indication of, of how in the hula community you'll have some very strong voices that will that will um, that will take the time to point out how important conservation issues such as this disease are. So when Kalena Silva agreed to to be on a, a PSA about about rapid ohi death. Um, or when a variety of kumuhula um, jumped on and, and uh, added their voices to, to the voice of conservation about the importance of not spreading um, the disease as a result of Mary Monarch's participation. That was a good example of how this can be turned into positive actions for conservation. But did you have other, 
other uh, issues or, or examples in mind? Mm -hmm. No, I was just curious if you thought this was a long-standing sort of tradition or whether it's a growing You know, after having the Costco meet, there's still I think whenever you're in times of abundance, it's easy to ignore conservation. Um, but whenever you have a resource that's threatened by something, or it's becoming harder and harder to find because people are over collecting, um, you begin to you begin to uh, um, have individuals and groups that will step forward and say, "This cannot, you know, this okay. cultural practice is going to be threatened if it's just as usual." That feels good, by the way. Any other comments or questions from from the room or from people on the phone? In a moment. On the phone? You might have to unmute if you've muted yourself well. I wonder if I muted them, they can't unmute. Oh. Someone texted, they said applause. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I can't see the text behind me. So you'll have to tell me these things. Thanks. Otherwise, oh yeah. Uh, I, I have a question. I was wondering if there were different roles for men and women in hula um, in older times, or there were some folks who argued that hula was was the realm of men in ancient times. Yeah. Um, certainly the first uh, the first depictions of Buddha that you see were entirely male. Mm -hmm. So that's an interesting thought. Mm -hmm. um, and the connection between the martial art Lua and mm -hmm. Hula um, is another is another possible reason. Mm -hmm. You know? Um, I remember when uh, you know there are certain there are certain things, right? Even in today's world, the uh, the the idea of gender equity in, mar in war, let's say, in warfare or the military, um, that probably wasn't quite as strongly expressed in, in ancient Hawaii. There are many stories of, of women battling alongside. Um, uh, so, and so therefore, why would there not be women folks trained in lua? That's a, that's a, that's a thought. And yet, you, you often don't see that in the in the written literature. Almost all the stories about olohe or or lua um, involve male folks. So I don't know. Maybe there was a gender thing going on there. Um, G Golden. I saw that message. Mm -hmm. um, so, but in in the realm of hula itself. That's a that's a good question. Certainly in modern modern times there doesn't seem to be. Um, you do I do see in stories much more um, many more accounts of men training to be chanters, interestingly enough. Um, and in the ancient and in the ancient stories, most of the well, you know, with with Hiyaka Kapodiopele and Hopoi and the origins of Hula being a female thing, it suggests that that the idea of men only dancing hula, that's probably not valid. I think any time that you make any generalized sweeping statement about gender and activity in Hawaii, you're bound to be wrong. Um, <laughs> now, you know Thompson, for example, was asked on Kaho Olave by a student when he was training women navigators. And they, they said, what's the precedent? What's the traditional precedent for, for women navigators? You know, and so now you know what kind of he usually turns his head down when he's thinking. Mm -hmm. was, I was wondering what he was going to come up with. And he goes, well, there's, there's Pele. And as soon as he said that, it was like, oh, we're doing Pele. And the tradition, of course, is that she navigated her canoe from Tahiti to Hawaii when she came here. So um, once you do that, then, uh, yeah, I guess women navigators are just fine. Yeah. <laughs> so, that was a cool thing. Uh, any other questions or comments? Jason, you have another one? Again, um, <laughs> that is interesting that, you, you know, when you, there are things like the, what was it, the Kuke and Kuke and where you have know, non-native species that have been incorporated in Kukula, it's an evolving art. And I was wondering if there was any indication or or who had anything to say about invasive species or or new species 
species coming to the islands over its evolution? Um, I don't know if hula did, but certainly hula has incorporated a lot of non-native things. Right, many lei, for example, that are worn in hula are not necessarily native species. Mm -hmm. Any bright colored flower or nice smelling, like sake is a favorite. Some right. Right. But sake is the Chinese, the Chinese jasmine. Um, so, and by the same token, even the uli uli, the gourd mm -hmm. rattle, what used to be gourd and among it's now la amia, which is the calabash tree brought in from I think Central America. Um, and the seeds used in there are now so so there's all there's all kinds of um, adopting of, of non-native species. Um, that being the case, you don't you don't expect to see um, a lot of. It's more an opportunistic thing when it comes down to the material culture, and even in the even in the realm of um, of song and inspiration for song. Um, there are so many songs about roses in Hawaii. Green Rose Hula, various other ones, uh, Maui Lokelani, for example, or into modern songs. So I think anything in Hawaiian experience, sen sensory experience, 